Hello everyone. As per one of my YouTube viewers request, I am going to discuss the Ramachandram plot in this video. I urge you guys to stick till the end to get maximum out of this video. Let's discuss Ramachandram plot. The Ramachandram plot is important to structural biology as it describes a peptide backbone in the context of its dominant degrees of freedom using dihedral angles phi and psi. Let's look at the original published manuscript by Ramachandran and colleagues entitled Stereochemistry of Polypeptide Chain Configurations. This research article is not freely available on internet but if you have any affiliation with any organization or university which has the access, you may be able to obtain the copy as I got my copy from my organization. Before you try to understand the Ramachandran plot, I highly recommend you guys to watch my previous videos on peptides and the peptide bond and protein configuration and confirmation at my website proteomicsmadeeasy.com. We know that the backbone of a protein, as you see here, can twist and turn into numerous conformations or folds, partially due to the amino acid sequence in proteins. If you understand how a backbone twists, you can understand the structure of protein and hence, you can also understand how a protein functions. The conformation of a peptide backbone is dependent on a number of parameters such as bond lengths, bond angles and dihedral angles. I am sure you understand a dihedral angle. If not, a dihedral angle is the angle between two intersecting planes. In chemistry, it is the angle between planes through two sets of three atoms having two atoms in common. Here, as you see in the figure, phi is between C alpha and N and psi is between C alpha and C. These dihedral angles are shared between three atoms and C alpha is common in both. Ramachandran and colleagues recognize that the twist of a peptide backbone can be described to a great degree by the dihedral angles phi and psi and these angles may be adjusted to form different structures. To understand this further, let's see what is positive direction of rotation of phi and psi. You can see here by arrows the directions of positive rotation about phi and psi. And if you can notice, the phi and psi conformation shown in this figure are equal to 180 degree. If you calculate this way, you can describe the backbone conformation of any particular residue by a point on a map with coordinates phi and psi. So depending the degree of rotation of phi and psi, protein structure varies or vice versa. Let's see what I mean by that. You can see here the different types of polypeptide helices. A molecular helix is defined by the distances such as the pitch, crystallographic repeat C and the rise H as you see here. The helices may be either right-handed or left-handed and may contain either an integral number of residues per turn or a non-integral number of residues as you see here n is equal to minus 3, 2, 3, 4 and 5. We call number of residues per turn N and the number of residues per repeat M. The repeat M must always be an integer since it defines an exact repeat of the structure. And if there is an integral number of residues per turn, the pitch and the repeat will be equal. So the N will be equal to M. The pitch can be defined as P is equal to NH. Note that as the number of residues per turn increases, the structure changes progressively from a flat ribbon to a broad helix and eventually to a closed ring with p is equal to zero. Alpha helix repeats after exactly 18 residues, which amounts to five turns. It has therefore 3.6 residues per turn. Since the pitch of helix is given by p is equal to n h, we can calculate the pitch value for alpha helix which is 3.6 multiplied with a rise which is 0.15 nanometer per residue in this case.
Now let's see what happens with the polypeptide helices which involve hydrogen bonding. If you examine the model for the alpha helix, you will note that each carbonyl oxygen is hydrogen bonded to the amino protein on the fourth residue of the helix. Thus, if we include the hydrogen bond, a loop of 13 atoms is formed as shown in the figure. Each of the helices has a different number of atoms in such hydrogen bonded loops. For example, in the 310 helix, there are exactly 3 residues per turn and a 10 member loop. The alpha helix could also be called a 3.6-13 helix and the pi helix can also be called 4.4-16 helix. The major difference between alpha helix and beta pleated sheets is alpha helix is held by hydrogen bonds in the same helix. The bonds are intramolecular whereas beta strands connected laterally by hydrogen bonds where chains are aligned side by side and held together by hydrogen bonds so the bonds in the beta sheet are intermolecular. So you see the value of phi and psi will differ in both structures. Now you understood the helices. Let's see the Ramachandran plot. The Ramachandran plot shows coordinates phi and psi. If a protein has all of its residues in a particular secondary structure, an alpha helix for example, the points for all residues would superimpose because of the regular precise turn, right? Thus, a single point on such a map also describes a given secondary structure. Such maps are called Ramachandran plots after the biochemist who first made extensive use of them. Also note that right-handed alpha helix can only occur between phi and psi values of minus 60 and minus 60 with little hindrance, whereas left-handed alpha helix can occur between phi and psi values of plus 60 plus 60 due to large hindrance. This plot illustrates the positions of various regular secondary structures such as antiparallel beta sheet, parallel beta sheet, collagen triple helix, closed ring, and flat ribbon. Also note that conformations with a given number of residues such as 2, 3, 4, 5 per turn lie on one of the sets of lines drawn across the map. The lines corresponding to the flat ribbon n is equal to 2 and points corresponding to the closed rings n is equal to 5 are particularly very important because as these are passed, the handedness of the helix changes. To understand better, let's imagine unwinding a right-handed helix until it becomes a flat ribbon. The value of n will decrease at n is equal to 2 when it becomes flat, right? If you continue to wind in the same direction, a left hand helix begins to form. I wish I could show you in 3 dimension here. Anyway, similarly, if you continue to broader and broader helices, a ring structure is eventually reached. With polypeptide helices, this is the 5 membered ring indicated on the diagram as I shown you before. If one continued to modify the structure in the same manner, a broad helix of opposite sign would be generated. One of the most useful features of Ramachandran maps is that they allow us to describe very simply which structures are theoretically possible and which are not. For many pairs of phi and psi values, atoms in the chain would approach closer than allowed by their van der Waals radii. Such conformations are strictly excluded. Ramachandran and other researchers have examined the entire map surface using models and computers to determine which conformations are allowed. These are shown as uncolored white areas in the figure. Clearly, only a relatively small fraction of the conceivable conformations is actually possible. All of the regular structures we have discussed fall into or very close to these regions. Although figure shows the left hand alpha helix lying on the edge of an allowed region, it is in fact not nearly as favored as the right hand form. This is a consequence of the fact that 
all amino acids and proteins are of the L form. With L amino acids, steric hindrance between the side chains and the backbone of helix is less with a right hand helix. Such side chain effects depend of course on the bulkiness of the side chain. The map shown here was drawn with the assumption that all side chains are alanine with CH3 groups. If the bulkier region is considered, the allowed region would be smaller or shrunk even more. Conversely, glycine, which is not at all bulky, allows more conformations than are shown here. You can see here the parameters of polypeptide secondary structures with different phi and psi values for each. If you plot these values on the map, you can see where they fall. The Ramachandran plot is especially useful because proteins are hierarchical in structure. The tertiary conformation of a structure protein is composed of discrete secondary structures that interact with each other and which are strung together by loops that are less regular. Each regular peptide structure describes a backbone whose per residue phi and psi values are generally the same and therefore their locations on the Ramachandran plot acts as structural landmarks. This simplified figure is referenced from the published research paper by Ranjan Manish where you can see where the different secondary structures fall on the map. If you get chance and want to learn more, you should read this interesting research paper. I have referenced it below the figure. I hope you understood the Ramachandran plot. If you have any question or you want to give feedback on my videos, please feel free to comment. That would be very helpful. And also check out my website proteomicsmadeeasy.com and subscribe to my channel for more videos. Thank you for watching.